Hello, welcome to the final lecture. Um, I suppose I'll do a screenshot now and maybe if more people show up, I'll do another one later, but get it out of the way as long as I'm not sharing my screen. Um, okay, so don't actually need this. Great. Um, so for today's class, we finished the ethics of ambiguity. Um, we'll talk about it uh, for, I don't know, probably like the first half or so of uh, the class time. Um, and then we will uh, sort of do a roundup, wrap up, sum up of everything that we've talked about and learned over the course of our summer session together. Um, so buckle up. We got one more and then we all go our separate ways. A little, a little sad. Um, so let's see. I'm going to share my screen and we will get ripping. Okay. Does this work? Yeah. Okay. Ethics of ambiguity part two. And again, this is our last lecture. Everything is due August 11th. The ethics of ambiguity or something. I don't know. Right? Ambiguity. I don't know if it would be like a soft E or a hard one at the end, but there you go. I don't do many requests, but I can, you know, make an exception for our final moments together. Um, great. So uh, do work, get good grades, earn them. There's plenty of opportunities uh, for uh, earning those grades. Uh, ask for help if you need it. Uh, I would. So I just looked at the grade book before class. It, it, it appears that about two thirds of everybody right now is passing and will do better than passing. Um, and about one third of the classes, even after attendance today, um, will still be sub passing, which means that about a third of you need to get on the discussion boards or uh, take the final. You may also retake the midterm uh, for half credit. Um, so if, if you end up needing like 25 points that way, um, you can earn it if you're writing a paper. Remember those, everything is due August 11th. August 11th is the, the final day that you can write on the discussion boards for points. It's the final day that you can turn in a paper for points. It's when the final exam is, is ultimately due. Um, so remember you earn your grade, whatever you put in is what you get out. So um, put it in, get out what you wanna get out, pass, BA, whatever it is, you make it yourself. Um, so go be free and make it. Um, and again, if you need help, I'm here to help you through it. Cool. So moving on from the beautiful sunset picture, uh, we should remember from last time, Ethics of Ambiguity Part 1, uh, that ambiguity uh, is related to two forms of freedom, which are uh, the result of the two uh, methods through which consciousness interacts with the world. Uh, both insistently and ambiguously, which is to say sort of passively and actively. And we have this distinction from Sartre that uh, de Beauvoir uh, uh, bootstraps for her own purposes and in, in constructing this methodological ethics of ambiguity that is of the in itself and the for itself. Now, uh, recalling that the in itself is our facticity, the object sort of material nature that, that like we have bodies that uh, perform biological functions that actually interact and are like physically committed to the world. And then there's also the for itself, which is our eminence, like the, the thing that makes us what we are. It's the, the self, the ego, the soul, that sort of quality of thing, right? Um, the, the mind that exists in the body and, um, you know, where mind and body overlap, at least there's always the sense of mind as some kind of uh, extra thing. Now you can be a perfect uh, scientific determinist and reduce mind entirely to body, but still you cannot reduce the feeling that there is some special extraness about um, mind over body. So that's the for itself, right? It's supposed to characterize that uh, idea. Now consciousness is insistent in that it just, it, like it perceives, we can't help it consciousness perceives, but it's also ambiguous in that we can um, create 
our own meanings. We can construct, reinterpret, reimagine uh, the world as we see it. Uh, and in doing so, we impose, or as uh, de Beauvoir calls it, we disclose uh, the world to ourselves and to others as such, as we imagine it, as we interpret it, as we see it, as we act within it. Um, and these two forms of conscious action uh, in relation with the in itself and the for itself uh, reveal these two kinds of freedom. We're condemned to be free naturally, right? Conscious freedom. Um, uh, this is sort of like natural uh, fact that the consciousness just freely and spontaneously does what it will. And then there's also ethical freedom, which is the sort of committed active form of freedom that we employ when we interpret the world, when we uh, bring the for itself closer to the in itself and our nature and attempt to unify. Though this unification is, as de Beauvoir tells us, strictly impossible completely. Um, there's no uh, like Godhead in any individual um, in which the for itself and the in itself are perfectly unified. Uh, and so there's always going to be this space. And in the space between, there is ambiguity. Okay. So this is setup number one. Setup number two is to emphasize the importance of ethical freedom, right? So uh, when we are constructing ethics of this ambiguity, that space in the middle of being uh, that is obscure, opaque, unclear, that uh, inspires anxiety, anguish, despair, uh, that there is a positive aspect to it. But in order to attribute the, our, our will uh, to achieving that positive aspect, um, we have to focus our wills on ethical freedom, the sort of freedom associated with the active form of, of consciousness, um, where we are working to, to unify uh, the for itself and the in itself in our nature. And this ethical freedom is something that we're committed to. And that insofar as it discloses the world to ourselves and discloses the world to others by creating the world that we, we see of it, um, we're committed to others also having this active uh, or engaging in this active unification process. Um, and it's, it, it becomes communal in the sense. And so my act of ethically uh, or, or a willing through uh, the powers of ethical freedom uh, also inspire me to act uh, for the sake of ethical freedom generally insofar as that form of action, that form of interpretation, that form of attempting to unify the for itself and the in itself uh, is a communal project. Okay, so this is like, again, the, the beginning, what we learned last time. And there are ways that this process is mistaken, right? Where uh, you assume yourself not free, that you, you become the, the Calvinist uh, fire and brimstone uh, preacher on the pulpit. Uh, there's nothing you can do. And so you become very serious in the world around you as if you were a child following the instructions of your parents, uh, teachers, uh, priests, mentors, whoever it is that the older and the wiser, you do what you're told and you take those injunctions very, very seriously uh, because the world is, has been created without you. It is not, uh, uh, it is intractable. It is uneditable by your own powers uh, and yet you live in it. And so you must take it seriously if you are to uh, survive and do well in such a world that is already crystallized uh, before and for you. Um, there's also the subman who uh, accepts the fact that they're free, unlike the serious man, the, the world is open to them, but they, uh, they don't think well about their, their freedom. They don't treat it uh, with the sort of responsibility that comes along with uh, freedom. Uh, freedom comes with responsibility. And for the subman, um, this person accepts their freedom, but also the uh, very radical and as Camus called it, vulgar expression of uh, there is no God, therefore everything is permissible that we, we hear in, in Dostoevsky, right? Um, and this is a dangerous place to be. These are the people that um, are able to do anything, uh, even the, the most awful sorts of actions. Uh, and then we also have the adventurer and the passionate who sort of like do well enough, but aren't quite uh, all the way committed in the right sort of ways. The adventurer is committed uh, to an ethic of quantity rather than quality, and so is solipsistic, 
in their, their acting and their willing. They will freely uh, and they will for the sake of unifying the for itself and the in itself nature in, in some respect, maybe. I, I think uh, it's up to Camus to actually explicitly respond to say if that's um, what the adventurer would do, but at least um, for the sake of argument and consistency, we can say that the adventurer through the, the ethic of quantity wills to unify the for itself and itself nature, um, though the willing is not communal. It's solipsistic, it's internal, it's something that only exists in that adventurer's head. There's not a commitment to others because there's not the acceptance that uh, the freedom of others can disclose our own being to us. And in fact, to have being disclosed to us, it requires um, others to be acting uh, with this active ethical freedom. Uh, and then the passionate, um, again, falls short. Okay, So there are ways in which we can be uh, mistaken in either our denial of uh, the, the fact and power of our freedom and the responsibility that we have in light of it, um, or for uh, accepting that freedom, but not using it in the right sorts of ways, like the adventure and the passionate person. Okay. But there is a path forward. There, there is, again, uh, a middle path, right? And this is the, the positive aspects of, of ambiguity that uh, de Beauvoir uh, is, is um, uh, going to mention in, in the, the section of ethics of ambiguity that we read for today. Um, so the path forward is, just as, as I've said, is to will universally this uh, expression of ethical freedom so that the disclosure of being and the acting freely is what's unified in a present moment, not only for one's own sake, but for the sake of that form of activity at all, the form of activity of disclosing being, of acting with ethical freedom, which is, again, the communal action. So what does this look like? Um, if the good will, right, the, the person willing well, uh, wills the universality of freedom through being, how can that person, uh, how, how can that be willed and also everybody get along, right? How can we all be free and, uh, and will what we will freely, uh, even if it's for the sake of like everyone acting freely, but not run into problems, not butt heads and uh, find ourselves in conflict. So we get the positive aspect of ambiguity or aspects, I suppose it should be plural. I made this meme too. I, I like it. I think it works on a couple of levels, um, but leave that up to you guys. So de Beauvoir's goal for the rest of the book in, in carving out this path forward for us is to explain how it's possible to will freedom for its own sake, accepting the contradictions, that is the antinomies, which we'll talk about, um, and the ambiguity that comes with such a willing. Uh, she'll also critique tyrants uh, and oppressors and their political movements that betray the core existentialist program, though appear to be consistent with it, um, will redefine ambiguity in opposition to the absurd. So we get a clearer picture of ambiguity. It's a funny sentence, clearing up ambiguity. <laughs> um, the hope is to inspire ethical acts of freedom, or at least how we can begin to act for the sake of ethical freedom. Um, and we do this by asking, which uh, book de Beauvoir does this, by asking what are the positive aspects of ambiguity? Uh, how do they work? And how can the ambiguous position of human being uh, be used and clarified? The first positive aspect is the aesthetic attitude. Okay, so the vaporwave attitude. As she says, thus every man has to do with other men. The world in which he engages himself is a human world in which each object is penetrated with human meanings. It is a speaking world from which solicitations and appeals rise up. This means that through this world, each individual can give his freedom a concrete content. He must disclose the world with the purpose of further disclosure and by the same movement, try to free men by means of whom the world takes on meaning. We may call this attitude aesthetic because the one who adopts it claims to have no other relation with the world than that of detached contemplation. Outside of time and far from men, he faces history, which he thinks he does not belong to, like a pure beholding. This impersonal version, this impersonal version, vision, it should probably be vision, this impersonal vision equalizes all situations. It apprehends them only in the, only in the indifference of their differences. 
it excludes any preference. And when I read this, I mean, these, these are like the important pop-out bits. Um, when I read this, it sounds a lot to me like the, the opening oneself to the goal and difference of the world that Merceau uh, has, at least the way that he expresses his sort of existential realization. And for all of uh, the pages that de Beauvoir took Camus to task in the first section of, uh, of the book, uh, it, the, the end state, at least affectively, is it, it reads to me very similar to uh, Camus. And so you might think, well, they're totally different thinkers and philosophers and <laughs> existentialist paper core. Yeah, um, that's the aesthetic attitude. And, and the aesthetic attitude here is affectively, with an A, uh, similar to Camus. And, and so this is why they're all like, like the existentialists. We call them the existentialists. And we open the class with the question, like, what is existentialism? Every existentialist thinker is just distinct from every other, though there are incredible overlaps. And I think this is one of them, um, that the same attitude that leads us towards uh, the ethic of ambiguity is also that same attitude that Camus' absurd hero uh, embodies um, in each of their different uh, aspects, conqueror. And Nietzsche has something that he calls the aesthetic attitude too, but it's something completely different, right? The, yeah, aesthetic interpretation. It's a redeeming <clears throat> sort of quality. Um, and I wonder if if there is, I, I, for Nietzsche, uh, the, okay, so, so this is a naive perspective because um, I'm by no means a, like Nietzsche scholar, but given my reading of Nietzsche, uh, I would not say that in any way, shape or form, would he recommend an indifference? That said, there might be ways to draw from Nietzsche's artistic attitude, the attitude of life affirmation, uh, similar principles that are present in the existentialist indifference or whatever. Um, and, and I think that's that's probably like an interesting project and, and doable, though uh, indifference is not something as at least an affective state of indifference is not something that uh, Nietzsche would be super happy with. Right. Um, he was all he, he was against all forms of asceticism, not yes. as, aesthetic, but ascetic, right? Yeah. Um, not a fan of uh, Buddhism and Hinduism and this like withdrawal from the world. It was all about this like incredibly um, uh, 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 sanguine interaction with the world, right? And indifference and sanguinity are uh, on their face terribly compatible. Though I, I think the that there are, like I said, overlaps to be drawn. So the aesthetic attitude, similarly, interestingly similar, I should say, to um, Camus. This is the first positive aspect of ambiguity, that in the face of ambiguity, in the same way that in the face of absurdity, Camus draws his three consequences, in the face of ambiguity, the first consequence, we might call it to extend the metaphor of the language here, uh, is this aesthetic attitude. And what it consists in, um, is a uh, uh, kind of creativity. It's that we disclose the world by the ways in which we interact with it. And if I disclose a beautiful world, then it's, be it's a beautiful world that we share, right? Insofar as uh, I construct the, the Roman temples and Colosseum, those are public works that live out in the world. Insofar as I um, come up with some concept that beautifies you know, the world, um, then you know that the world becomes beautified through it. So that there's some interesting, here's like an example of an aesthetic attitude that might work in this way. There are some arguments out there in uh, the overlap of literary studies, ancient literary studies and anthropology that the color blue didn't exist at the very beginning of, of uh, like human mm. culture, right? So uh, there are like, like four mentions or something like that of the color blue in uh, ancient texts like the Vedas uh, from uh, India. Uh, the, I think there are none in any of the Homeric tradition. Um, everything is like wine dark sea uh, and you know the like vast expanse of sky, the rosy fingers of dawn, all this stuff, right? Like every other color but blue is used. And there's a point at which in the, the literary vernacular, blue enters in. And it's not that people weren't seeing blue, it's just the concept wasn't there. And whoever was the first to say, 
there's a distinctive color to the sky that matches these other sorts of uh, objects in the world is the first person to disclose this meaning to the world, this blueness, right, as a concept. And now it's been appropriated and used and, and uh, become universalized as a, a quality and part of the human experience. And looking up the sky now, it's not very blue because it's full of smoke, but we might on a normal day outside of fire season, find ourselves looking up and saying the sky is blue. Um, and this is a kind of world disclosure inspired by an aesthetic attitude, assuming the hypothesis about um, blue being sort of a, a later innovation of uh, the human aesthetic experience that, that I mentioned. It's an interesting one to look into at least. Um, and so this is, if, if the world is ambiguous, like you look at the sky before the color blue and you think, yeah, it's nice looking. Um, and then you interpret it, right? You become conscious of the world, uh, of the world through the sky as having a kind of blueness, then you disclose to everybody else around you, you, you make that a feature of the world. Um, so you go from ambiguity to clarity in one small way. And this is the aesthetic attitude. Now, it's important to note that it's also an attitude of indifference. There's no preference in the existentialist disclosure. There are only expressions that are necessary to dispel absurdity, ambiguity, despair, etc. That insofar as we're free, radically, right, and radically responsible within that freedom, um, we are the ones who determine uh, how to disclose the world. That uh, if, if there were better and worse ways to disclose the world, then there would be some essence that preceded our existence. It's up to us to disclose the world. And so there can be no preference at the outset, at the point of freely disclosing. Um, but you might get some later on, like we, we learned that it's not great to be a sub man or a serious person or, or whatever, right? So one disclosure is at the point of creation is as good as any other, as long as it satisfies the right criteria. And for de Beauvoir, these criteria are authentic and responsible manifestations of ethical freedom, which is the next positive uh, aspect of ambiguity, okay? So as she says, one of the chief objections to the will to freedom, right, that she and her existentialist counterparts are uh, recommending is that it is only a hollow formula and offers no concrete content for action. So if we're all free and there's no reason that guides us uh, in, in deciding how to use our freedom, then it's a hollow formula. It doesn't give us any direction at all. It's uh, it, it's it's like asking, or it's like saying the 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 color blue is is uh, th there are two blues or something, right? That, it just doesn't really make sense. They're like like yeah, there are two blue things. It, it it's it's like almost incomprehensible if the the formula is so hollow as to tell us about how we should act, but then gives no actual like uh, force of action. It inspires no movement. Um, so you can ascribe colors to numbers, numbers to colors, all you like, but they don't click together. It, it doesn't illuminate either concept in any robust way. Um, so the objection here is that your will to freedom uh, doesn't tell me what to will. It, it just is, okay, I'm willing freedom, now what? And that's that. So the way de Beauvoir responds to this objection is by saying that disclosing being and willing freedom are the same thing. Insofar as we act, we disclose the possibilities of being to others from our own perspectives, right? So if I'm the one who invents the color blue, I say, the sky is blue. And somebody says, what? I say, look at it, it's blue. And they say, oh yeah, it's kind of like that, that other color, right? And then we get the color blue. So I'm disclosing the possibility of the sky having a particular color to someone else. But from the other's perspective, there's also uh, disclosed the necessity to will freedom. Wow, this person uh, acted in such a way as to be able to disclose the world as such. Uh, I'm like this person, I'm able to disclose the world in these ways as well. And so there's this um, interactive uh, disclosure insofar as one of us wills freely in disclosing being. Uh, that power is discovered and inspired in the other. And this is why, again, it's communal. So the aesthetic attitude plus a will to freedom gives us the formula for the creation for the sake of disclosing being. Um, whatever you do, you'll disclose being. And if you, because of the aesthetic attitude, we must create. It's just like, the, it's our lot. We're condemned to be free. We're condemned to, to create and better to do it from an aesthetic attitude than not. 
um, from a wanton one, I suppose. Um, so as long as we're willing for the sake of freedom or willing freedom for its own sake, and we must create, then whatever we create uh, will be consistent with the goal of freedom, so says the Beauvoir. So it's not actually a hollow formula. Uh, we have no choice but to disclose being, and we can do that formalized by a will to freedom, she argues. So if it's done correctly, this kind of disclosure, so acting freely, will inspire for a further willing of freedom, but it can still go wrong. Freedom constrains itself when science demands the truth, when science says, uh, I don't know if you could see that or not on, on the camera, but I, I dropped my clicker into my hand and now I can measure it and say, gravity is 9.81 meters per second. That's the truth, capital T, right? Uh, as soon as, as that next step is taken from going from theory to law to robust metaphysical truth, the, the like ontological state of being in the world, in the cosmos, uh, has it that gravity on earth is nine, can be measured as 9.81 meters per second. I mean, it might just be true in like every case, but to declare its truth because of its scientific quality um, is to go one step too far. It's to say, it's to unify for itself and in itself. It's to um, say that there, are, there is a, a clear path through the ambiguity all the way through, but that's never the case for what it is to be us. There's always a distance between what the world is and what we are in it. Um, and so even for uh, uh, what appear to be truths or like really powerful scientific facts like um, the, the power of gravity, um, there is, there must always be uh, recognized the distance that we have between its possibility of being completely true and our, uh, the, the strength of disclosure that comes along with making such a claim. Uh, so science goes wrong when it demands the truth, it constrains freedom. Uh, similarly, when art establishes idols, uh, when, when we say uh, that Beethoven is the standard against which all other music must be judged, um, or uh, perfect, uh, the, the, the perfect royal English is that against which all other uh, English dialects must be judged as better and worse. Um, as soon as we set up these idols uh, as the truth or the way, uh, we constrain ourselves. Um, and it is our lot to be free. And so making this leap is kind of philosophical suicide and not just a philosophical suicide, but one that constrains our freedom, that which allows us to clarify ambiguity in general and all the way through. And similarly, when the politician operates from say like the mandate of heaven or mandate of history um, from a kind of teleology or um, divine purpose or whatever it is, um, when you, uh, declare that there's an essence preceding existence that guides you forward. These are all mistakes. Being is thoroughly ambiguous all the way through. And the goal is not to break through this ambiguity. It can't be done. Rather, the goal is to clarify it. Or, and as I was writing this, I was thinking maybe it's not to clarify it because that also seems to me like a kind of crystallization, um, but maybe to be in the activity of clarifying right, to be engaged in the process by which the ambiguity might begin to be dispelled or, or in, in, become in a state of dispelling ambiguity. And this is what it is to be free. The suggestion that it can be clarified in, in total is, is in bad faith. And it's on this note that we get a, a cool objection that, that I'll only talk about briefly, but it, 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 it occupies a very large chunk of, of the second half of the ethics of ambiguity on tyranny and oppression. So as de Beauvoir says, we have to respect freedom only when it is intended for freedom, not when it strays, flees itself and resigns itself. A freedom which is interested only in denying freedom must be denied. And it is not true that the recognition of the freedom of others limits my own freedom. To be free is not to have the power to do anything you like, right? It's not that everything is permissible in the vulgar sense, rather, is to be able to surpass the given towards an open future. The existence of others as a freedom defines my situation and is even the condition of my own freedom. And this is why tyranny impression and oppression become problematic. The tyrant and oppressor and oppressor who wills only their own freedom at the cost of others' freedom, uh, who objectifies others, right? Turns them into objects to be cogs and, and wheels that move the machine of the expansion of their own uh, freedom 
um, that kind of willing is not to be respected. The oppressor comes up with all sorts of excuses, all of which justify their will to limit freedom and in, in, in doing so in, in bad faith. They say the oppressed don't deserve it. They don't deserve freedom, right? Or they'll say they want to be oppressed, that this is just this person's nature. Um, they're not like me. I'm the sort that can handle it. You're the sort that can't. Um, or I do it for the greater good. And we, here we have like a lot of reminiscence of Ivan, right? Ivan is, is um, convinced by the vulgar expression that uh, everything is possible in radical freedom. Um, but here we begin to see an objection to the, the tyrannical oppression that can come from uh, these sorts of attitudes, because these attitudes are justified in bad faith. These all, argue, the, all of these arguments justify the act of limiting freedom and along with it, limiting being. And the oppressor, insofar as they expand their own freedom in this way, limits freedom generally, and so recursively hurts themselves, that they're acting in bad faith because they're acting for the sake of their own freedom, right? That they're, they're uh, building warehouses that turn people's, people into machines so that they have the ability to go to space, right? That they're they, they turn people into objects, tools, for the sake of having a limitlessly, limitlessly expansive uh, uh, openness of choice. But in doing so, what they've done is, is, is this person, this oppressor, this tyrant, has uh, 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 constrained freedom in thousands and thousands of cases, uh, cases of, of people who could be also out in the world disclosing being freely for themselves if they weren't forced to work 12 hour days in warehouses without windows like um, automated machines, right? And so it's bad for the oppressor. Um, even though the person is able to go to space, they do so hollowly and in bad faith. Um, and they not only hurt themselves, but really very greatly the, the world and the people that they objectify. So the oppressor is at least correct, to, like to give the oppressor something. Um, the oppressor is at least correct in revealing the difficulty of willing freedom without limitation, right? That freely willing causes problems. And in extreme circumstances where we're objectifying people and putting them in warehouses so that we can go to space, then yeah, like that's pretty egregious. But there are other less egregious cases where there, there's still harm being done. Um, and in fact, all cases of action, de Beauvoir will tell us, are problematic ones. Um, uh, and, and this is where we get what she calls uh, the antinomies of action, right? That insofar as we act at all, we, uh, even if it's free, we, we act and so constrain freedom in some other sense. Um, and in the egregious cases of, of uh, tyrannism and oppression, it's just very clear what's wrong. But in these uh, limited cases of intending to do well, but insofar as you intend and do well, um, you still also cause harm, that's a problem. So let's get into it. What is the antinomy of action? As she says, no action can be generated for man without its immediately being generated against men. No one governs innocently. So we have a cause and we have a cost. And every action uh, for the sake of will have a cost uh, as its consequence. And this is the antinomy. No matter what we do, uh, we will cause harm and there will be uh, uh, problems. So for instance, we need to defeat the Nazis, but this requires sacrificing a generation of young men, right? Throwing them out of the field of battle, um, even as a general to objectify the, the soldiers, right? To uh, treat them as, as tools, means to an end. But it's a, it's a necessary one for the cause, right? To uh, overcome fascism, to overthrow the, the Hitlerian regime, right? Um, it is a cause for the sake of, of ethical freedom, of continuing to will freedom of, for the future, which we'll talk about in a moment, but it causes incredible, incalculable harm to the generation of young men and, and women and lives lost uh, at war. Using renewable energy comes at the cost of Detroit, destroying impoverished mining communities, right? So we wanna, uh, use more windmills and solar power and maybe even like natural gas and stuff, right? Um, but what does this do? This puts people who like have had generations even of uh, uh, economic fortune tied to coal mining, uh, completely lost and destroyed. Those lives, you, you don't get them back. Um, and even if you're doing a good thing for the world and for the future and for everybody around you, you are condemning the people who have 
no other choice, no other economic or uh, free mobility to, to do other things, they will suffer, right, for this greater good, right? There's a cause and there's a cost. There's an antinomy. You can pass a just law even more abstractly, but in passing any law, you constrain freedom. You can pull a lever to save five lives, but you condemn one man to death, right? This should be familiar in the trolley case, right? Go just like becoming more abstract. So a single person's life, de Beauvoir recognizes, is incalculably valuable. There's no way to quantify the value of a life and of the potential expression of freedom that that life uh, might be able to disclose in being. And it's for this reason that sacrifice, as de Beauvoir tells us, gets its meaning, that there is a sacrifice of incalculable, infinite degree in the cost uh, that is incurred or told by the cause of action for the sake of freedom, uh, for the sake of willing freedom, that um, when, we, when we will it so. So on the one hand, we must will for the sake of freedom, but on the other hand, this willing is not without its due sacrifices. So what can justify action in the face of such a contradiction, right? How do we resolve the antinomy of action? And de Beauvoir's answer is gonna be the future and, and the future understood in the right sort of way. Um, so before we go there, I wanna pause for a moment uh, and ask if we have uh, any questions with what we've covered so far, because it, that's it's a lot. So we have uh, sort of our, our three positive aspects and now we're getting into um, like the, the problem, uh, the, the, the antinomies of action and the resolution. So at least with the setup, with the quality of liberation, freedom, disclosing of being, the aesthetic attitude, that creative attitude, um, any questions at this point? No questions. Okay. Well, then we will continue on. Well, I've just got I've got a quick one. Um, isn't the idea though pro action? It's very pro action. Uh, even though she's recognizing these antinomies, that's just the sacrifice that you have to make and bear responsibility for in some way, but knowing that there's no escaping it, right? Yeah, that, that's that's right. Um, there's no yeah. escape, but you still, you still, she's still promoting an active life of doing all you can in the most reasonable way, but you still have to be responsible for the, like realize the, the casualties and bear responsibility on some level. That's correct. And, and it, it, what we'll see by the end of this is that at bottom, everything remains ambiguous, um, which leaves us with a bit of a, it, it should throw us for a bit of a loop because we, we begin or we end where we began. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so it, it'll, it'll be a little bit problematic, which is also one of the, the, um, the, um, The, the points about this work that de Beauvoir was disappointed in. Um, she said that her work, I, I think I talked about this last time, was too ambiguous or not clear enough or didn't go far enough in giving a form of positive action. Um, but it, it, at least her answer is sensitive to the problem and the methodology, even if it doesn't give us um, a right way all the way through. Uh, and I apologize, I, I can't see your hands. The my the thing that shows me your faces has disappeared from my screen. I tried all tabbing into it. So if you guys do end up having questions, um, just like say something like I have a question in the chat or type your question and then I'll, I'll just answer it. Um, I might be able to see it too from right here. Oh, is that? So oh, yeah. I can yell at you. If okay. I see one. Oh, oh, I got it. Thanks. Yeah. Man, there you go. You should have told me that it was there the whole time. May I, may I just ask one other question? Yes, of course. I'm having a little trouble um, on some things, figuring out the difference between when she's arguing through other people's reasoning and, and then the point that she's really making, like on page 23, she says, um, the characteristic feature of all ethics is to consider human life as a game that can be won or lost and to teach man the means of winning. And 
then she talks about ambiguity and um, uh, she says the world becomes present by his presence in it. it it's just, it's, it's a lot of layers of, I don't know, I felt like in reading her that I almost, that she was assuming I knew, I kind of knew where she was coming from and that I would get her sarcasm or her, her pointed, her pointed um, statements about other ethics or other philosophies and see how it was in, insufficient. And I'm not sure I always did. And I'm just wondering this idea of ethics, considering human life a game that can be won or lost, is that, sir, is that cynical? Or is um, that, does she mean that in a positive way? I just wonder if you can enlighten that a little. I, uh, I read it as both. I think she's being playful and a little edgy. Um, because ethics for for ethicists, like say for people who develop theories of ethics, for Kant and Aristotle and um, uh, Bentham or Mill or you know, like all of these like major figures that um, propose a system of ethics, uh, even like theologians, right? Uh, they do not treat their system of ethics as a mere game, right? So by calling an ethics, a kind of game that can be won or lost, uh, strikes me as a kind of cynicism from the perspective of someone who, or for whom uh, uh, ethics is, is a matter of deducing the essence that precedes our existence and then living in accordance with it. However, it is playful, that is to say not cynical, from the perspective of the existentialist who is indifferent in the aesthetic attitude, for whom there are no better and worse ways uh, to will, to live, to decide, to be, to exist. Uh, because all of them are, as long as they are uh, the right sorts of expressions of freedom. Um, and so she's, she's being, she, in, from her own perspective, is being playful, uh, but then for the person who, um, you know, doesn't agree with the existentialist premises. It's a very cynical statement. Um, and the emotions of cynicism and playfulness uh, can often come from the same quality of, of expression. It's kind of mischievous. Okay, thank you. Uh, that's helpful. And that, that idea of pinning her down to the, that idea of, she does believe in an ethics and finding kind of the best, the best, most free, as far as freedom cho choosing way to live that respects everyone's freedom. And that's very idealistic in some ways. I mean, it seems really idealistic to me and yet she's doing it in this context of it, it being impossible because you're always gonna be stomping on somebody's freedom to, to do it, it seems like. So yeah. it's, it's really, it's really, um, a fine path to tread to be an insider in her way of thinking enough for me to get her jokes, I guess. Yeah, it, she's she's not a simple author. Her her prose are complicated, often unclear, uh, loaded with meaning and jargon. Uh, yeah, I mean it. It that so that that's strategically it's why I placed her last at, in the end at the end of the semester is because without having read all the other people that we read there there would be no hope uh, there's just there's no there's not, there's not even a reason to like open the book and try um in my estimation um and still I mean she's coming from a tradition that's so much deeper and thicker than we've had the time to to dig through this summer session so um Hopefully it's been enough to get like a grip, and it sounds like like you you have the the right grip because I mean you're you're um, batting with all of the same problems that that she is, and uh, the end goal is going to be something like a fine line or something very hollow, uh, depending on your perspective, whether it be uh, positive or negative of the of this project. Um, but her project is meant to. Uh, reveal uh, the way forward through the antinomies of action uh, by employing the right sort of conception of the future to justify the projects 
that we will for the sake of ethical freedom, that even if they cause problems, as long as we have the right sort of future in mind, then we uh, uh, will, it'll be worth it, right? So she says, the word future has two meanings corresponding to the two aspects of the ambiguous condition of man, which is lack of being and which is existence. It alludes to both being and existence. When I envisage my future, I consider that movement which, prolonging my existence of today, will fulfill my present projects and will surpass them towards new ends. The future is the definite direction of a particular transcendence, and it is so closely bound up with the present that it composes a single temporal form. But through the centuries, men have dreamed of another future, one in which it might be granted them to, re to retrieve themselves in glory, happiness, or justice, all capitalized. This future did not belong to the present. It came down upon the world like a cataclysm announced by signs which cut the continuity of time, by a messiah, by meteors, by the trumpets of the last judgment. This is the future, capitalized future, which appears as both the infinite and as the totality, as a number and as a unity of conciliation. It is the abolition of the negative. It is fullness, happiness. It is a future thing. However, those who project themselves towards a future thing and submerge their freedom in it find only the tranquility of the serious. So this is a mistake. Thinking of the future as, uh, as, the, like, as a manifest destiny for yourself, as a fated end, as the place in which all will be rectified, conciliated, all will be well, that won't that that's not the right future to, to act for the sake of, because that future is inhuman. It's not one that we will ever take part in or have a part in as we are humans in this life, in this form of being. Um, and here, you know, we've seen distinctions between Camus and Beauvoir, Beauvoir and Sartre with so, Sartre is, he talks about natural freedom for Beauvoir, it's the ethical freedom that's important. Um, and we've also seen overlaps, um, and here's an overlap with, with Ivan, right? Returning his ticket, that even if all were rectified in the end, that, that all were made well, we all lived in perfect harmony, it wouldn't be worth the tears of that single child. Similarly, right? Um, that the, the way that the human existence that we occupy now is one that uh, is imperfect, finite, um, that will cause the tears of, of children. Um, and so, like Ivan, Bavar is returning her ticket here. She's saying, I, I, uh, I will not will for the sake of that thing which cannot justify and cannot be an actual part of uh, my life. Rather, I will will for the future that first kind that is uh, a single temporal moment with, with the present, one that sees my projects through to their end, or at least has uh, you know, that possibility, that finitude open. So future one, this future I was just talking about, is the human causally connected uh, to the present future. It's a later temporal moment in which my projects of today are completed. And here's where you get this like single temporal unit. The, the, that future in which my projects are completed is unified causally with the one that, uh, with the present that I'm in now. But there's also the second future, which is the idealized crystallization of value and infinite perfection and the unified utopic vision. If there's nothing that, is in essence preceding existence, it, it is this, right? It is this idea of the future with a capital F. So de Beauvoir says, in this perspective, all moments are lost in the indistinctness of nothingness and being. That future doesn't exist. There's no being, strictly speaking, in it. There's complete conciliation, unification, the things that we don't have, that at, at the core of our being is ambiguity. Uh, and so we have to deal with it and there's no resolving it completely. That future promises the complete resolution, which is impossible for what it is for us to be. And so we are lost in the indistinctive nothingness that the, the lack of being in, in such a, a future affords. Man ought not to entrust the care of his salvation to this uncertain and foreign future. It is up to him to assure it within his own existence. This existence is conceivable, as we have said, only as an affirmation of the future, but of a human future, a finite future. So the antinomies of action, right? That every action comes at a cost. Demand sacrifice, demand a cost. 
And the only justification for sacrifice is a real finite human development and growth towards an achievable outcome is we, we don't sacrifice uh, like the ancient Mayans. I, I saw this article that they like dug up some ancient Mayan ch child bodies or, or one of them, I think. And it, it had like its stomach contents like totally preserved. It was like mummified by the, the soil or, or whatever. And they were able to see like the, the uh, liquor that like the the pacifying drugs they gave to the children who they sacrificed kind of interesting that they well i mean it makes sense because you don't want the kids screaming and flailing as you're trying to sacrifice them to the god of rain or sun or whatever it is um but the you don't make a sacrifice to uh a sun god hoping that uh at you know the the end of history because you've made the sacrifice you'll find your place in heaven right that sacrifice is never justified those child's tears go unrectified, unconciliated. But what can justify the antinomy of action is the finite future where we see that the, the present becomes something better because of the sacrifices that we made for it, right? That all of Europe fights against the Nazi fascist regime, right? Against Hitler to overthrow um, his evil destructive forces, right? And, and it costs the lives of many millions. Uh, and it's not for the sake of some future capital J justice that this action is, is performed, but for the future that actually sees the reunification of a working Europe where uh, people aren't being uh, uh, murdered in the, the millions and thousands for uh, their heritage, right? Something real, the completion of a project. Uh, Atticus, you have a question. Uh, more so like commentary, because I feel like uh, in some of her political projects, uh, it seems like she's definitely trying to do this march for capital J justice versus like this like I'm doing a march for this like hyper specific project, which is like, I don't know, like poor women in this neighborhood with XYZ issue exclusively. But that she seems to attach on to these like political ideals that are are always capital J justice, like especially I don't know some of her like Marxist flavorings or this like even maybe will to freedom is like this like this thing with a capital T that we should be striving for. But also then she's like you can't strive for capital letter things because those aren't like based in your reality. So then any action that you make towards those capital T things are like uh, an unjustified sacrifice. So I, I just maybe I'm arriving to a problem with with this part. I don't, that wasn't really a question. That was more of a like, uh. Sure, so it's it's a good comment. It's it's one that uh, inspired the, the slide where I had the, the question last week of, you know, like what the relationship between um, the project so far and, and her uh, sort of Marxist leanings were, that really worked. We, we talked about that last week. Um, now for this week's reading, at least in the conclusion, um, she seems to betray a, uh, well, okay, so let, let's also go here. So this meme is actually kind of expressive of that issue, right? Um, where we have an existentialist and a bar full of Marxists and they're like occupying the same space. They all have the same goal, right? To like get drinks and stuff. But um, the way that they're doing it is uh, uh, distinctive. That You see Homer sitting there looking like the fat old bald man among, among a bunch of like beautiful women, right? Um, it, it looks way different. Uh, and, and so, you know, de Beauvoir and Sartre, might have been the Homers among the the Marxists, right? Um, and the, the the mode of of transportation of the uh, the the rights for uh, impoverished women in some particular neighborhood, as as the example was, um, might require the the uh, the movements of the party uh, to like inspire political fervor and. Um, see itself successful, but that's not really the reason why she's out there. At least, that, so this is me like speaking on Debevoir's uh, behalf. Um, and 
And this issue is dealt with a little bit in the last couple of pages of the conclusion where she says that existentialist is, existentialism is at base a, an individualist project. It's, it's a private project. It's one that is about your expression of freedom, the way in which you act. Um, however, uh, insofar as the expression of freedom and the disclosure of being are unified, so she argues, uh, there is the, the communal quality to it. And so if existential, if the existentialist project begins from a subjective moment, then it is only for a, like exactly a moment. Uh, and then it, it flips over into a, like a communal project. And this is where we're supposed to find the ability to uh, authentically will um, for the sake of a political movement, which would appear to um, dissatisfy many of the existentialist principles. And, and by and large, the, the project of the ethics of ambiguity is to find the, the consistency in those projects. And similarly for Sartre's existentialism as humanism is to, to find a way to make the existentialist project work uh, out in the world as, as uh, consistent with, with a political world, one that re requires that people interact with one another, that it doesn't all reduce itself to quietism and uh, solipsism to living individually, the adventurer's life as Camus was, right? Um, though Camus engaged politically in his own private way, uh, very admirably in my estimation. So I, I think uh, the, the, the volume of the voice that's used by de Beauvoir and Jean-Paul Sartre to object to that alternative form of dealing with the absurd uh, is maybe a little unjust, given you know the praxis, the life project that Camus had. But I suppose that's neither here nor there. Um, what is here and there is that you're just you're you're right and just so that there is this tension between the the existentialist project and and the the premises that that it comes along with, and the uh, mode through which uh, political change happens, and especially. Um, the philosophically Marxist one, which requires, you know, like dialectical materialism and this sort of end of history concept and, and all that. Um, okay, so a couple of comments in the chat. Sarah says, that's the real paradox, that the most extreme devoted idealist sees their ideals as achievable. And Simone de Beauvoir seems to be saying that their achievability is a measure of their being worth it. Worth it is realistic and not idealized. Exactly, yeah. Um, and, and can you have an ideal project that is consistent with a finite future causally connected to the present? I think probably, um, though how that works, we might need to have Simone de Beauvoir in the room to explain to us. Dallas says regarding Camus though, he argued that anyone could live the right way as long as they lived fully. Yeah, so this is where you get the, the, the tension for Camus becomes uh, a tension between the openness of his absurd hero to all sorts of different forms of life and the uh, political convictions that he had and actually acted on. Um, so similar but different kind of tension. She, I, Quinn. Um, yeah, just, she kind of addresses this <clears throat> on page 166 as well. Um, she says, Heidel in his phenomenology has emphasized this inextricable confusion uh, between objectivity and subjectivity. And this is the thing that we're talking about. And it says, a man gives himself to a capital C cause only by making it his cause as he fulfills himself within it. It is also through him that it is expressed and the will to power is not distinguished in such a case from generosity. When an individual or a party chooses to triumph, whatever the cause may be, it is their own triumph which they take for an end. Yeah, so so this is, the, it's a helpful description. What page was that on? 166. Yeah, so page 166, she she addresses this. Um, and yeah, I, I remember this point. Um, the idea being that, yeah, the, the cause is made your own. But again, there, there's this, this question, right? Is like, what's the relationship between the cause, even if I make it my own, and that that actual finite future end state where the project does the good that you hope it does, um, it, it still even appears to be a kind of ideal, even if you appropriate it through the scope and um, uh, breadth of, of your own freely willing it. Uh, 
And that there's there's a tension there, at least uh, an unclarity that that deserves development. Atticus, your hands back up. Yeah, I was just was gonna say. So I feel like the way I interpreted all of that, especially that last comment, uh, was just that like you can strive for capital J justice as long as you're striving for your individualized capital J justice, not some communal project of capital J justice. Does that make sense? Up until the last part, I'm not sure what the <sighs> communal, how that's to be distinguished from those other two that you mentioned. So like, as long as it's uh, like, we're not. Oh, you cut out. Oh, is it better now? Yeah. Um, that we're not operating for this like false second future, as long as we're not thinking of like this universalized capital J justice, but we can still be striving for this like real tangible finite future one, as long as that justice is only like my personalized capital J justice and not this like capital T truth, capital J justice, if that Something makes sense. External. Yeah, yeah. yeah that, that's right. Um, okay. and, and so just to like double down to just repeat, um, again, the tension as, as I see it at this point, so, so that sort of like, if you appropriate the, the cause uh, through the scope of your own freedom, then it becomes individualized, it becomes your project, right? And then it satisfies the existentialist premises. But then there's still the kind of tricky way of explaining how, even though the cause is like yours individualized, what gives it enough concreteness to be a practical form of action and not something too abstract or too esoteric. Um, and that seems unclear to me. It seems like it has to still be something that's in a state of flux. It can never be absolute. It can, it can be your capital C cause, but it can't be an idealization, a crystallization made by someone else or some institution that is a their capital C cause, which they distribute out to serious people and they, they appropriate and give themselves quote unquote meaning through. It has to be something that you put effort into and put thought into and is still plastic enough that if you wanted to change it, if you wanted to walk away, if you, any of that, you could. Yeah, it's great. I, I like that idea a lot. The, the plasticity of, of the concept of a cause as appropriated by one's own will that your project becomes for the sake of. Um, as long as that cause is always sensitive to you, your, you, right? Yeah. The, the for itself that's you, then, um, you're acting in good faith, you're acting authentically, which again, to bring in Camus, that's what he did. You know, he like eschewed the communist party and all of the different sects of it because they wanted him to you know, be one of the cause. And um, he even ended up eschewing like his other existentialist friends and, and the people that like uh, said, you're not a, a real one of us because you don't really think like us and um, you, you don't, have the right sorts of opinions about oppression in Algeria and stuff. And yet he's, you know, arguing on behalf of both colonists and Algerians to defer their death sentences and stuff silently, quietly, um, that he had his own convictions and lived by them sensitive to him uh, rather than to some external cause, maybe uh, in contrast to the Beauvoir and, and Sartre, who very loudly followed all sorts of different communist forms and causes. Um, and and the, the plasticity, the, the sensitivity is I think a, a good way to, to transition into Devin's question, which is value is this lacking of being of which freedom makes itself a lack, right? As I understand this, I think this is incredibly obscure language. Uh, and to be totally honest, I, I'm, I'm not sure if this is the right interpretation, but I can at least give you like how I read this. I read this interpreting uh, this like value is lacking being and, and freedom making itself a lack as, uh, as understanding that uh, all the way through deep down, you'll hit ambiguity or absurdity, whatever you want to call it. Um, and there's that lack, that space between the of itself and the for itself in our nature, or the in itself and the for itself in our nature. Um, and, and so the, that this is what like demands both freedom, responsibility, and the plasticity of uh, uh, conceptual projects um, and so when freedom wills itself, it's willing, it, it's willing for the sake of clarifying that space, that lack um, in the middle. 
that's that's how I understand it. Mm -hmm. Though again, that the language is really obscure, and, and I think um, there are probably smarter people than I who could better explain what that means. But again, um, it, it's it's a tough it's it's a tough sentence to to crack open. I think you're on the right track, though. That sounds. Um, so Atticus, how does this not get turned into a solipsistic project again? Um, the communal nature, right? So it's mm -hmm. even if if you're you're appropriating a cause through the scope of your will uh, for the sake of willing freedom, uh, insofar as you act from the aesthetic attitude, right? Because you have no choice but to act. Uh, this is the aesthetic attitude. Um, then that the the particular form of the cause as interpreted through the scope of your uh, uh, will, will, will um, produce works and actions in the world that disclose being and freedom to others. Uh, so the 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 form of consciousness and appropriate interaction with the world is solipsistic. However, the form of this uh, attitude, I suppose we can call it, this attitude of consciousness towards the world uh, comes at the same time, runs in parallel with the co-communal disclosure, the inner subjectivity, as Sartre calls it, um, of acting at all. So the, the, the form is solipsistic, but the the form must express itself insofar as we exist, insofar as we are, insofar as we be, right? Um, and that other quality forces the, the disclosure uh, outwards and from without uh, the disclosure that happens without forces itself inwards. And so you get the, the communal connection. Yeah, that's exactly right. So Attica says, so it's communal, communal because everyone is working on their own willing of freedom, even if that willing of freedom is different for everyone, it's the work that unifies. Exactly, because it's the work, the willing of freedom as the Beauvoir has told us is identical with the disclosure of being, which is what makes the, the practice and the process communal. It's what um, uh, connects us to the other uh, and puts us uh, square in the same world where we're responsible to one another, that I act freely and insofar as I do so, I'm responsible for uh, that action because I'm disclosing that action to you as one that, that can be done, that should be done, in fact. Um, and it's this, this co-communal disclosure. Good. So let's, let's move on. So I don't want to ask that question. Utility, historical, teleology, rapture, eudaimonia, duty, these are all what we've been calling causes, maybe externally, right? These all lose their meaning in the absolute finitude within which our wills must operate to authentically will freedom. But we can appropriate their ideas, right? And, and make them our own and, and will for the sake of them. And, and in doing so, we're uh, doing good, says Bavor. We're, we're doing the project of uh, uh, producing and willing for the sake of ethical freedom. And yet, all the way down, as, as we've been saying, there, there is ambiguity. And so even if we set the future as our justification for action, which is meant to, to, to justify, to resolve, to at least um, in, in the, the probably even poorest sense, mm -hmm. to make sense of the sacrifices that come on the back of acting, um, there is ambiguity at the bottom of everything. So we, we end where we begin. Right? We end in ambiguity just as we began there because we needed ambiguity to inspire the ethics of ambiguity. And the ethics can only get us so far as to clarifying and illuminating, but not dispelling completely. The fog remains. So if we reject the idea of a future myth in order to retain only that of a living and finite future, one which delimits transitory forms, we have not removed the antinomy of action the present sacrifices and failures no longer seem comp compensated for in any point of time. Thus, we are not ending by condemning action as criminal and absurd, though at the same, thus are we not ending by condemning action as criminal and absurd, though at the same time condemning man to action, meaning that we're damned if we do and damned if we don't. So if we get off the con contemplative boat, like the thinking project here at this point, we see a lot of reason to really like Camus' project, right? Because if we're damned if we do and we're damned if we don't, this is the absurd. 
And uh, this is what makes suicide the only serious philosophical problem. Um, because no matter what, we're damned, but there's a middle way through, which is where we rebel against damnation. We rebel against the absurdity. And so if we stop thinking, if we think the antinomies of action is as far as you can get, then period Camus project becomes really important, right? Uh, but if we don't get off the boat, de Beauvoir says the notion of ambiguity must not be confused with absurdity. Absurdity precludes the possibility of meaning at all. Damned if you do, damned if you don't, that means damned all the way through, no meaning. However, ambiguity, if we understand this at bottom problem, the space between uh, that, that constitutes the human nature, the, the nature of being at all. Ambiguity, unlike absurdity, precludes an ultimate unification of meaning, an ultimate meaning, right? Meaning with a capital M, but not meaning making. Ambiguity can be clarified, unlike the absurd, which is thick all the way through. And an ethics of ambiguity aims at doing so without the need for any a priori future myth justifications by, uh, or to act by willing ethical freedom. However, all finite justifications, insofar as they are so, remain ambiguous. So the antinomies of action will always be problematic, but at least what we can do is clarify our way forward some finite small amount. We can't justify our actions all the way, but we can do our best. Right? And this is what she's saying. We can do our best and doing our best to clarify, to make better is better than uh, not making better at all and just making for the sake of rebelling, right? That rebellion is an empty project, uh, though it finds a middle path through the antinomy of action, sort of by walking on top of it, uh, it, it, doesn't, uh, it doesn't resolve, justify, or even attempt to the, the uh, uh, make sense of the, the, the problems and sacrifices that come from acting. Um, and we are committed to these sacrifices insofar as we're responsible for them, insofar as we are radically free. Uh, and so an ethic of ambiguity is one that strives towards clarification, is one that pushes the edges of the antinomy uh, farther away um, so that we can uh, feel the positive effects of, of being and, and you know, hopefully make the world a better place, at least um, will for the sake of that which is the only power within us to promise the ability to dispel ambiguity or absurdity at all, which is the, the power of ethical freedom that uh, is open and available to us. So an ethics of ambiguity that ends us where we began with ambiguity. Have we come full circle for nothing? What are we supposed to learn from ethics? Um, maybe I saw a couple of hands. Uh, what, did, did anybody have any questions before we come to like the final conclusions here? I had just put up my hand briefly, uh, just cause uh, this just feels frustrating and like incomplete because <laughs> the ambiguity like can be clarified except we, in this class, and I think in her work also makes effort to say that it can't be clarified, like capital C, but you can only work towards clarification. So it feels like this whole project, which maybe this is like a little dramatic, but it turns into into like busy work or like the devil idle hands. So we just gotta constantly be doing something, even if that something is like never gonna come to fruition, as long as we're doing the thing, then that is a fruition we should look for. Good. So I think that's exactly the right feeling to have at the end of this. It, there, there remains a tension. Um, and one is either satisfied or not with the um, relief of tension, even if it's not complete. And so we'll see how de Beauvoir, de Beauvoir recognizes this tension. That's why she brings up ambiguity again at the very end of the book. Um, recognizing the tension, here's how she answers this question. So it will be said that these considerations remain quite abstract. What I've said so far is esoteric, abstract. What must be done practically? Which action is good? Which is bad? But to ask us a question, such a question, is also to fall into naive abstraction. We don't ask the physicist which hypotheses are true, nor the artist by what procedures does one produce a work whose beauty is guaranteed. Ethics does not furnish recipes any more than do science and art. One can merely propose methods, strategies, tactics, right? Um, 
that her ethics of ambiguity is really a kind of tactic to living in life rather than a grand strategy, I suppose, is, is probably the, the best way of putting it. So what methods or tactics have we learned? If we begin with ambiguity, we reason through it and then end at a point of ambiguity. We have a big ambiguous sandwich. What, what's the, the, the meat and bread that makes it up? Well, one, existence is disclosed to us as ambiguous. Two, we're ultimately free and it's through the willing of freedom that we can dispel some of the ambiguity of our collective being. That is through the ethical freedom, not just natural freedom. Freedom is a value, three. To be willed is a communal and is a communal project and so rejects the oppressor and tyrant uh, who hoards, right? Who objectifies, who constrains and condemns others to be uh, unfree. And all actions come at a cost and there are no a priori justifications for any action. No uh, perfect uh, response, reconciliation for any consequence. Five, to justify action, we must not only look to the future that is human and real and achievable by the ends of our projects. In order to justify action, we must look to this first kind of future, right? The, the not future myth, but the real human future. And finally, if we act in this way, we do what we must come what may, and we are thus able to act authentically. And again, it has to do with this like authenticity of action um, to, to ask like, what's the good way of doing things? What should I do? Um, this is too abstract. This is the wrong kind of question to ask, says de Beauvoir. Um, rather, we give ourselves a method, a tactic, a, a form of action and uh, hope that come what may will come well. Which leaves us with the concluding remark that regardless of the staggering dimensions of the world about us, the density of our ignorance, the risks of catastrophes to come, and our individual weaknesses within the immense collectivity, the fact remains that we are absolutely free today if we choose to will our existence in its finiteness, a finiteness which is open on the infinite. There's a very old saying, do what you must come what may. That amounts to saying in a different way that the result is not external to the good will which fulfills itself in, in aiming at it. If it came to be that each man did what he must, existence would be saved in each one without there being any need of dreaming of a paradise where all would be reconciled in death, the end. Um, and that's where she concludes. So idle hands and do what you must come what may, I think carry different convictions. Um, though what they end up looking like in practice might be similar. And if you think that this sort of attitude, because that's all it really is, it's an attitude that gives us, you know, these sort of um, uh, recommendations for how to win the game. Um, that kind of attitude uh, doesn't prescribe any particular action. It just prescribes a, a, a set of methods for coming up with your own active prescriptions yourself. And if you have these, these, these lessons, these methods, these tactics in mind, as you are willing, then you will do what you must. And uh, de Beauvoir ends on an optimistic note. She says, um, that's enough. That with these ideas in mind, to will and do what you must, doesn't matter what that is, what will come is what will come of that. And the optimistic note is to say, and all will be well. We'll all be better off for uh, acting in this way. And the optimism um, in light of the tension, the persistence of ambiguity may feel unjustified, but for de Beauvoir, it's better than nothing. And so do what you must come with me in, in the right sort of way. Nice try. <laughs> yeah, couldn't help it. Yeah, might as well go get the cup of coffee. <laughs> okay, so that's the ethics of ambiguity. Don't leave yet. We still have some, some lecture to go. Uh, we're going to do uh, a group activity. And for those of you at home watching this asynchronously, you can do this at home. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to break up into small groups and choose one scribe to write down your answers per group. Um, here's your assignment. In a sentence, 
What have you learned from this class that will affect how you think or act in your life? What is the practical upshot of existentialism broadly construed for you? Okay, so you can either each give your own answers individually, in which case write your name and give an answer or come up with an answer as a group, right? And, and the reason we're doing this is that uh, existentialism is an historical philosophical movement. It exists in the past, it's history of philosophy. However, uh, it, I mean, there's a reason you're all taking it and um, there's a reason we're all here. And that reason is that this historical movement, so distinctive as it is, has practical lessons for our everyday lives, at least practical effects for us. And, and I'm curious, I wanna hear what you feel having now gone through um, some of the most important body of, of existentialist literature, um, where you stand, right? Um, either together or individually. And I, I think it's probably also helpful hopefully to, to share this with each other, to, um, to, to express what the lessons practically you've learned, not just like what existentialism is, but what it is to you and what it'll be to you going forward to share these lessons together. Because I think oftentimes we, we might have the lessons in us sort of implicitly, but when we talk about it with someone else, so you get that kind of aha moment that then opens it up for you to um, employ more actively in your life. So uh, we'll take let's say 10 minutes uh, and come back and then discuss some of the answers. And then we'll do a, a brief sum up of you know, the whole semester so far and then call from there. So I'm gonna pause the, the recording and we'll come back when uh, the groups are complete. Okay, so we're back to recording. Everybody's back from their groups. Uh, email me your uh, groups answers, or your individual answers, or if you're at home, email your own answer. You get five points. It's a lot of points. Uh, at, like trying to help pad things at, at the very end, give you throw throw you all a little bone, or five bones, or whatever it is, right? Uh, so easy points to earn. Uh, also, hopefully, a fun conversation. Um, here in class, we talked about the the like wartime feeling of the the quote, "Do what you must." Uh, come what may, right? And how uh, you need guidance to the expression of your freedom, that there has to be like a, a structure and a limitation, right? That there has to be some form through which we express ourselves freely in order to express ourselves well. Would, would you guys agree with that, yeah. that sum up? Definitely. Cool. So that's what we talked about in person. And I did get one email, um, which is, uh, interestingly distinct from that discussion, which is from Flash, Rachel, Jack, and Anai, which is that individual freedom is obtained when we dispose of societal limitations. Um, so I'm wondering if, if one of you guys might like to um, discuss what you mean by that and then see if we can find some sort of resolution between these two, and then we'll let the other groups like share as well. Or not? <laughs> okay, I think what we were, uh, what we were talking about were um, existentialism. I, I, reading existentialism to me really helps me um, get a sense that my life has a little bit more freedom than it uh, sometimes feels like. And that would be, it kind of gives me the sense that I, I am, like my life is an individual project and I'm not exactly what I'm uh, feel like I'm forced to be by society. I'm kind of able to create uh, my own intellectual project. And I feel like that is the real benefit, at least for me personally, reading existentialism. Cool. Yeah. And, and so, I mean, I'll, I'll glue the ideas together myself. I, I, I think that's totally right. And then, that, and that's like one half of the project is the, the, uh, the presentation of freedom, the like, hey, remember, yo, you, you do it yourself. Um, but not forgetting the, the structure of the appropriate way in which to use freedom, right? Which is to combine the, the two ideas from our two groups there. Um, so super cool. Uh, and by the way, side note, tangent, if, if you guys ever become teachers, the, 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 the trick is to uh, ask a question and wait 
in silence and count to 10 in your head very slowly. Uh, and almost always, like 90% of the nine and 10, you get a response because like the awkward silence grows and I don't feel awkward. And it's like, <laughs> it's an imposition on you guys. Uh, but then it, in that like one in 10, then it doesn't work. Then, it, you know, you confirm the awkwardness of the situation and that, that like squares it and makes it that much more. It's an effective strategy. I like that. Yeah. So uh, consider yourselves constrained to answer my questions. <laughs> Um, other groups, what do we come up with? Uh, what's the life lesson or individuals or anybody who'd like to share? We've, we've read existentialism. Um, where does it take us? Oh, you're muted, Jack. I think, is Jack muted or can I just not hear him? Oh, sorry. Right. I was, I wasn't supposed to, I wasn't trying to talk. Yeah. Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> sorry. I'm wondering yeah. at that point that he made, I'm wondering if that's something that would have, someone would have felt pre-social media. What feeling? Of like an individual and less than like what society expects you to be. Ah. Because if you, you know, I grew up without social media and I never felt that kind of, ever felt that kind of societal pressure or like I'm supposed to be something in comparison to the people around me. It was much more individualistic journey because it was just like in the world. Mm -hmm. It wasn't constantly inundated with content and my surroundings and other like all the time yeah I, I completely think so i think that social media has an incredibly restricting constraining effect on us and not it that's not to say that that didn't exist before right like there's still like masculinity and femininity to which we all are imposed upon um for better and worse um but those are the, those and other like societal maxims that that are imposed on us the, the things that make us feel like the child or the serious man, as de Beauvoir would say, um, are uh, uh, really macro, or typically at least really macro. But what social media does is it, it crystallizes down to the most minuscule like everyday experiences. Uh, it reduces thought to 156 or however many characters tweets are now. Um, you, you take pictures of your everyday, you share even the mundane moments on Snapchat and in your like stories and all these different apps and stuff, right? That everything is, um, is represented and crystallized and, and, and there, there's kind of a, a beauty in the expressivity and like the artistic way in which you can share the little parts of your life. And then there's also um, the, how easy it is to construct idols and how easy it is to hide yeah. um, the, the truth and mind manipulation through advertisements. Like every third Facebook post, fourth Facebook post is an ad. Every eighth Reddit right. post is an ad. And you probably don't even notice, but it's doing shit in your mind. It's taken over. Oh yeah, we're um, all free. Social Dilemma on Netflix. So yeah. I couldn't recommend it more. Yeah. yeah. Well, and she kind of talks about, um, De Beauvoir does, uh, about crystallizing your past and how that can become problematic by making the past an idol, like you oh, said. You know? That speaks exactly to this because yeah. well, human beings, we're, we're fallible. We're not meant to be held in this state of permanent accountability for things like what we are now. Even if it's just a narrative or a yeah. theme for yourself. Yeah. You know, it, this is why midlife crises happen, yeah. right? Is that you set up a life for yourself, your whole mm -hmm. past is for the sake of, and then you achieve it. Uh, and then what? By a Mazda Miata. Right. Uh, Atticus. Yeah, uh, our group didn't really come up with a group answer because that was a very hard question to answer in a sentence. Um, but I think uh, what I emailed to you was just saying that I think existentialism just breeds frustration for me currently. Um, and a, like, on one hand, uh, I find the project like deeply, deeply comforting that like, I can look at all of the awful things happening in this world, whatever, and that there is some comfort that it's just absurd. Like I don't have to live up to this capital E enough of whatever that means because there isn't a capital E enough. Like it, it there's no whatevers, right? Uh, and that I'm fine existing however I'm existing 
and you just do what you have to, and that's great. Uh, but I, on the same hand, also deeply frustrating because then it's like, okay, if there's never a capital E enough or like this end goal that I'm striving for, how do I enact change? Why do we even care about enacting change if in the end, like Jeff Bezos is still gonna go up in another rocket because the ocean is on fire and everything is terrible. Like, so I think it just like breeds this intense frustration and tension in me of like uh, comfort in the void, but also it's all the void, it's all the void. Yeah, yeah. So, so I might recommend in the mode of therapist, um, a particular interpretation of the, the latter feeling, which is to say that it's kind of a wakefulness, uh, that there's like the, the, um, the good feeling, the comfort of being free in spite of, there's the empowerment in having wind conditions for how to exercise that freedom. And at the same time, there's a recognition of the way that everything is taken advantage of and, and um, abused and the way in which like the Nietzschean twofold feeling, for instance, um, you might recognize yourself or us collectively as uh, uh, having all the potential for greatness and uh, currently being in a state of pretty animal awful uh, inner subjectivity that doesn't work so well in many cases. Um, but that doesn't need to be, if that's the interpretation that, that we take in, in light of this experience of having learned uh, and, and are becoming awake through the, the project of, of existentialism, then that feeling need not be a kind of inspiration for nihilism that is not an inspiration at all, but actually an inspiration um, to feel empowered, to recognize the possibility and openness of one's power and freedom, uh, and then to do good, you know, um, to, to recognize what's broken, because that's what that feeling expresses, is that it's broken, uh, but you can fix it. At least you can try. Um, Dallas. Devin says God is yeah. dead. <laughs> um, okay. I think like, I, I probably would classify myself under like the serious man from the work done from like the ethics of ambiguity before this class. And it's like, Having this class has let me like kind of let go of some of the stuff that like that doesn't make sense, even though I try really, really hard to make it make sense. And so I just I feel like I just have like a lot uh, a better framework for like analyzing what comes my way in life now, and I can like a lot more easily just kind of like shrug it off rather than like really try to grasp like wrestle with it when it's just not worth wrestling with, you know. So, so what's the point? So. Cool. Yeah. So, so absolutely. I mean, that, that, that's uh, another, the affect, it, it, that's to mention the affective state. So we've talked a lot about the practical projects of, um, of existentialism, but what, what Dallas brings up now is, is the affectation is the, the like emotive quality. Cause this is such like an important feature too. It's not like what we do and how we do it. It's what we feel like. And, and the, the um, character of consciousness as it engages in the existentialist project. And that is one of cool indifference. It's a contemplative attitude, um, similar to Stoicism or uh, Buddhism, but with more commitment in the world, right? Um, and that kind of indifference uh, is not inconsistent with empowerment, even if empowerment is, you know, like a, like a kind of powerful, uh, way to feel and to be. Um, but the indifference is one that uh, inspires possibility. And sometimes that's all it takes, right? It's just recognizing that there is possibility, that there is, um, there is room out there to act and to be and to do you. Uh, and that in doing so, uh, you can do you well. Um, and, and the indifference is what opens us up to that possibility. And then it's a matter of just using the freedom that we're all empowered with to uh, be expressive in that way. Scott. Yeah, um, 
one of the philosophers I think about a lot is is Bertrand Bertrand Russell, and how he kind of set uh, a goal for himself to you know design like this perfect ultimate logical mathematical capture everything under set theory all that stuff and uh, totally failed to accomplish that right like uh, you know discovering that the job he set for himself was impossible um, and I think that there might be a comparison here with the existentialists because the thing that they're trying to do or we're trying to do might be actually fully impossible but like Russell who ended up contributing so much to mathematics and logic along the way that he charged towards his personal project. Uh, number one, the existentialists did the same thing in helping, you know, the, the purchasing the putting in this class so that people who feel comforted or helped by this writing and also kind of confirms that concept of charge toward your personal project, do your best, come what may, and it seems like people are able to do a lot of good with that, even though it isn't the capital P ultimate truth, that that's not the absolute solution to everything. There seems to be a positive heuristic there that, that can help people. Cool. Yeah, so so um, before addressing that, particularly connected to Dallas's um, idea here, is that the the indifferent attitude also inspires um, that, right? That, that you can, in spite of failure, act anyways, that you, you're not committed to anguish and despair, uh, even knowing that the project is incomplete and imperfect because you're indifferent to the outcome and there's still good that can come um, despite futility and, and finitude. So, so that's just to connect these two. I, I really like this idea as well um, because although existentialism is an historical movement in philosophy, it has, it, it, it spread itself out. It, it, um, inspired literature and movies, film and uh, uh, play and theater. It inspired um, uh, it inspired so many different artistic ends, music and, and everything. And still to today, it, when when you hear you know some kid at a coffee shop um, with straight black hair and and you know some eyeliner and earrings or whatever, you know, like th this kind of person, like, you know, looking super hip and fly at a coffee shop talking about philosophy, like they're probably talking about Nietzsche or Camus, right? That there's something about the existentialist that connects with um, what we are uh, frequently as adolescents, teenagers, um, and at, at the end of adolescence and teenage, when we're beginning to think for ourselves for the first time to recognize our freedom, that there might be a failure of the project, um, but it's power to have affected society both artistically and continually through um, the growth and development of independent thinking and independent thinking with like form and purpose um, continues to inspire. Uh, and, and so, yeah, like, you know, there, there aren't existentialists today as there were, uh, you know, in the, the 40s, 50s and 60s. Um, but existentialism uh, may not have uh, died out and hopefully won't uh, insofar as it continues to be an operative and inspiring force, something that um, can help us live and think well. And I, I think that, at least in my own case, when I, when I was that adolescent reading Camus and Nietzsche, uh, I pinged all over the place. I had all sorts of angsty interpretations and uh, misinterpretations. And um, it, it took, you know, study to, to like settle into uh, a way of, of reading these, these guys that, that sort of unifies the, the thinking and the project and um, settles the, the ideas, not that like Nietzsche is a nihilist because he's not, right? It's a misreading, but to actually get like a, a thorough understanding. And that was kind of the goal of this class, right? Is to give you guys that ability to, to read and, and see these ideas and, and not just as they're represented in your future reading of, of existentialism, but in the, the inspired forms of art that still exist to this day and are being created that um, see connections to and, and in existentialism, to see that um, the project 
uh, though incomplete is, is not itself a failure. So super cool idea. Um, Dallas says, I think it is also important to note the environment in which existentialism thrived in 20th century after World War II. I think life became devoid uh, in meaning for a lot of people after witnessing these atrocities, especially in Europe. And I think that's that's another interesting point too, just to say like, look, where existentialism uh, shakes the world is in this post-war meaningless, very absurd world. And what are we looking at today? We're looking at a world in pandemic, in isolation, quarantine, in destruction, sickness, fear, um, one that uh, constantly tries to cover itself up with um, crystallizations of beauty and fun and happiness that we don't actually feel, but we represent because we feel it's important uh, to appear that way through social media. That What's to say that the world we're living in right now isn't just as absurd or very close to becoming um, as hollow as the one that uh, was bombed out, um, you know, 100 years ago. Uh, there's a, a revival, a revitalization, a, a need again for this kind of thinking. And now you all are, um, are empowered with these ideas to share them with your friends, your family, your coworkers, the people that you're out there in the world with to give them that feeling of empowerment, the uh, coolness of an indifference and the, the recognition that in spite of it all, there is a possibility to, to change and do. Um, great. So we'll end the, the discussion there. Um, and just to like show you guys what we accomplished, we read all of this. And now it's like, it's a little um, cheating to like have the full brothers Karamazov because we read like, you know, that much of it. So we'll say in, in terms of volume, we read this much. That's, that's like, that's a, a lot of books. You guys did it. That's awesome. I mean, it's like, I like doing this. It's cool to like see in, in, in like actual material form, the achievement that, that, you know, you all have, have uh, earned, managed, completed. I, I mean, and, um, you know, despite all the lessons, like that's an accomplishment to have worked through all of that. Um, and we started with The Stranger, uh, which gave us the feeling of absurd and is supposed to inspire the, the project of existentialism. Um, to, to give you a sense of where we're going and uh, what we might find when we get there, though leaving things unclear. Uh, and as we develop, we continue through a literary path. We read the Brothers Karamazov, the Grand Inquisitor passage, and we get a sense of the problem of abandonment, of the non-existence of God, or even of the existence of God, at least of the problem of being in the face of evil, of the, the abuse that is possible through freedom and, and the responsibility that each of us have in light of it. Now, if God does exist, there is still a problem of being, at least so says Kierkegaard. And, and so what we see in Kierkegaard is uh, the, the problem of being reflected in, even in the light of God, as one that is a problem in the difference between the infinite and complete unity that is God and the finite um, whatever we are and the, the uh, incommensurable distance between these two kinds of uh, being. And, and here we are needing to live for that because of it uh, and, and make sense of the ethics of our life with the spirituality that's demanded of us um, by the divine. And this is a problem, uh, but if we reject God, if, if, we, if we do not accept God, if we return our ticket, then must we be nihilists, right? If, if God is dead, if we've wiped the horizon from the sky with the sponge, then who's going to paint it back? What sort of person could um, be the one to empower themselves, to, to feel the, the, uh, the joy of living such that they could affirm it all the way through and uh, live life such that you know, they paint back the horizon, right? Um, this is the project that, that we, we get from Nietzsche. And, and after Nietzsche, um, we uh, dig into the, the core existentialists, right? From this position of uh, an atheist 
existentialism, um, the problem of being takes real form and character through Camus, through Sartre, and de Beauvoir. And we read all of them. In Camus, we get an absurdist existentialism that takes uh, being to be essentially problematic all the way through, and that we must rebel against it. Uh, Sartre and Beauvoir want to give us a more communal uh, way of recognizing the existentialist premises without admitting of an impossibility of action outside of rebellion. Uh, and so we see that um, existence precedes essence. And this leads us to uh, recognizing our freedom, the inner subjectivity of our experience, and eventually, uh, ultimately, to an ethics, a way of living, a way of acting in the world, that the problem of being is not a theoretical imposition uh, placed upon us, but uh, a call to arms, a call to action, the ability to uh, move through the world, to uh, be who we are, and to make the world uh, a better, more beautiful place from the aesthetic attitude by expressing ourselves, um, being who and what we are. Cool. So that's that. Thanks for, for you know, being here. And if you're watching, thanks for watching, um, taking part in the class. I hope you learned a lot. Uh, send your answers to me if you want the five points. Um, remember to do your grades. Please fill out your course evals. They're really important. Um, and yeah, August 11th is the final due date. Thanks again, guys. It's been a really good class. I've enjoyed teaching you all. You've been, you've been uh, fantastic students. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.